second. Okay. So I'm going to start the live stream. Okay. Okay. You can you can start. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining uh, this afternoon. Um, so we're very fortunate to have Professor uh, Ruth Marie Clay as our colloquium speaker today. Um, she got her undergrad degree from uh, Harvard and her master's and PhD in astrophysics from UC Berkeley. Um, she was awarded the Mary Elizabeth Ohl Prize for her PhD dissertation. And then she became a postdoctoral fellow um, at Harvard Institute for Theory and Computation. And then where she later um, became a lecturer at Harvard as well. And then in 2012, she became a Kavli Fellow uh, of the National Academy of Sciences. In 2014, she became an assistant professor of physics at UC Santa Barbara. And in 2015, she was awarded the uh, WAS Helen B. Warner Prize in Astronomy. Uh, in 2016, she became an associate professor of astronomy and astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz. And today she's a full professor at Santa Cruz. Um, in 2017, she became the, the E. K. Uh, Gunderson Family Chair in Theoretical Astrophysics at, at UC Santa Cruz. Um, so Ruth is an expert in the formation of planetary systems, both in our solar system and exoplanetary systems. And she study, studies uh, both the birth of planets and gas disks around young stars, um, dynamical evolution of uh, planet orbits and the evolution of atmospheres due to escape over time. And today she's going to tell us about the origin of structure in interplanetary systems and how to produce the frequency of super, super Earth and gas giant planets that's seen in observations. Um, so for everyone who's um, in the audience, please keep yourself muted during the colloquium unless you have questions. And then you should feel free to unmute yourself if you would like to ask your question during the colloquium or you can save it to the end um, and ask a question at the end. And uh, please take it away, Ruth. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about the origins of structure in interplanetary systems. That's where we have most of the data that we have about uh, the, the structures of, of systems of planets around other stars. But I'd like to start um, with this uh, picture which takes a slightly broader view and to ask the question, is the solar system rare? Um, in other words, is the structure of our solar system, the, the dynamical orientation, the, the types of planets um, in our orbits in orbit around the sun uh, common um, in the universe? And I think that that's a really exciting question to ask because it relates to whether the Earth is rare, whether the properties of our planet um, that have, of course, been an excellent place to uh, evolve life um, are common elsewhere. And the reason that I'm gonna be talking today about interplanetary systems is as you probably know, that's where we have most of our information. But if we want to ask, answer this question, is the solar system a common outcome of planet formation? We really need to understand um, the, full, uh, the full outcome across um, parameter space uh, of, of planetary systems, including at large distances. And so one of the things that I'm going to be doing is talking about some ideas that we've been having in our group recently about what sets the structure of interplanetary systems and in particular, um, what consequences those ideas have um, for what's happening at larger distances from their stars in the hope that as our data expands to larger and larger distances with better statistics, um, we can test some of these ideas um, and answer this question, is the solar system rare? All right, so just to orient um, all of us, um, I'll remind you what the properties are of uh, known planets so far. So on the left here um, is a, a plot showing the orbital periods of detected planets um, and planet masses or their minimum masses from the radial velocity technique. And on the right is the orbital period and planet radius. Now these don't have the same sets of planets on them because we don't have masses and radii for all planets. Um, so on the left we have primarily um, radial velocity detections, uh, though there are some transits as well. And on the right, um, we have primarily uh, transit results from the Kepler satellite. Mm -hmm. So if we take a look at this um, and just restrict uh, our, our uh, look to the top part of this plot, we can see the population of known gas giants. You can see that most of the gas giants that are known are from the radial velocity technique. This is the this red line shows the location of Jupiter. So they're primarily closer to their stars than Jupiter. That's a selection effect. Um, and they're also primarily, uh, there are a little bit of them have lower masses than Jupiter, but a lot of them have quite a bit, uh, are quite a bit more massive than Jupiter. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, later in the talk. 
Now, if you look down at the terrestrial region, planets like Earth, Venus, and Mars, of course, there's empty space on these plots. That's, again, a selection effect because we are unable to, uh, to look at most systems in that uh, region. But if we look in the middle region of the plot, then we see the, the biggest result from the Kepler mission, which is that there's a large population of super Earth planets um, located interior to the orbit of Earth, um, all the way into very close orbits to their stars. So we know that about a third of the stars in the sky have systems of super Earths like this. Uh, so this is a very common outcome of planet formation. Um, and that's of course, nothing like the solar system. So we already know that the solar system is not the typical outcome of planet formation, um, but we don't necessarily know that it's a rare outcome as yet. All right, so just uh, um, a reminder of the standard um, idea about how planetary systems form. So planetary systems form um, as an, uh, a side effect of the star formation process. So this is uh, the classic Orion Nebula. And here in these insets, you can see you know, little baby stars with disks forming around them. And in those disks, uh, planetary systems are presumably forming. So as the gas and dust falls onto the disk and is processed through those disks um, onto, the, onto the central star, uh, you end up with a site for planet formation. In the outer regions of that disk, you have gas, dust, and ice. As you get close to the star, then it just becomes gas and dust where it's hotter. Uh, and in that disk, um, we're gonna form our planets. Uh, there are a couple of you know, fundamental uh, properties that could give you a sense of what kind of planetary system you're going to form around any given star. And that's one way I really like to frame this question. If you give me a star, what kind of planetary system are you gonna make from it? And what are the key properties of that system that tell you the answer? So, um, so if, if we imagine that this is our disk, inside here are you know, little bits of, of dust that are going to collisionally grow until they become ultimately planets over many orders of magnitude. And if we have more material, then that is going to lead to faster growth of this uh, through collisions. Um, and also if the, the relative velocities of things or the, the collisional time scale is shorter, then, um, then growth is faster. And it turns out that the collisional time scale scales with the orbital time scale. So as you go farther and farther from the star in the disk, that orbital time scale is longer and your growth time increases. All right, so we can put these things together, together to get um, the classic story about why you might make a planetary system like ours um, that, uh, um, you know, prior to the discovery of exoplanets. And that is that if you're in the inner region of a disk, you have less material. So you have less material. Um, and that means that you can grow to make, you know, puny things like the Earth. As you go farther and farther from your star, you have more material to work with. And that's for two reasons. The first is you get colder. So again, now you have ices to work with to make your solids, not just um, silicates uh, and, and other refractory elements, um, but also just because essentially the area of the circle is bigger. So you have more stuff and you can make larger solid planets. And in fact, if you make a core that's large enough um, that it can start accreting a massive uh, gas uh, envelope, a massive atmosphere from the gas in the nebula, then if it can actually accrete a mass comparable to itself in gas, now suddenly it's twice as massive. So now it can accrete another mass of gas comparable to itself. And you can see that this can become an exponential runaway process um, until you form a gas giant. Uh, go further and further from the star and you can still form those very large cores, but you have a longer orbital time, a longer growth time. And so if your growth become, time scale becomes comparable to um, the lifetime of this gas disk, which is a few million years, then maybe you don't have enough gas left over to form those gas giants once your core gets big and you can end up with an intermediate thing like an ice giant. And the ice giants um, have about 10% of their mass um, in their envelopes as compared to, you know, for a terrestrial planet, 10 to the minus six of its mass or, um, or Jupiter, which is 95% of its mass in gas. So these are really intermediate type objects. All right, so that worked very nicely. Um, and um, I'll just add one more piece of physics uh, that's really important for that story. Um, and to do that, I'm gonna remind you about uh, 
uh, what a planet, the planet's hill radius. So the planet's gravity, a planet's gravity dominates within its hill radius, which is similar to its Roche lobe radius. And this radius is a set where the planet's gravity is balanced by tidal acceleration um, from the sun. So this is the distance within which, for example, you could have a moon orbiting your planet um, and its orbit would be stable. And um, if you consider a planet's hill radius inside of the disk that it's forming inside of, then you can define something known as isolation mass. Um, an isolation mass planet has accreted all of the gravitationally accessible material from inside the disk. So it's accreted all of the stuff um, interior to a few hill radii from its location inside the disk, and it can't reach the stuff beyond that to gravitationally accrete. So, and that's true as long as you don't have any replenishment from the disk into this gap that um, we're imagining our planet forming um, out of. And for example, the solid material of the disk. All right. So if we go back to our diagram of, um, of the you know, solar system structure formation, then in the inner region of the solar system, the idea is that there's a small isolation mass, uh, in fact, smaller than the earth. Um, and you need a late giant impact phase to complete planet growth. So you had giant impacts, one of which um, was the moon forming impact. And, um, and that gave you your last little bit of growth up to the terrestrial planet masses. And in the outer solar system, the isolation mass um, plays a key role here as well, um, because uh, if you want to make this, um, this process of having ice giants only form like right at the end of the disk, uh, uh, of the disk dispersal and only get a little bit of gas, um, the way that models do that without having a fine tuning problem is essentially that the isolation masses in the outer regions of the disk are just small enough that it takes quite a while to build up enough mass to, to run away um, into a gas giant. So, uh, so this is, again is, is very nice, um, but recent models um, from my work and, and a number of other work, uh, groups um, have shown that um, the presence of gas in a protoplanetary disk calls some of these uh, some of these ideas into question. Oh, before I get to that. So I want to um, come back to this idea of what is the structure of um, a planetary system and what are what is it about a particular star that might make a um, uh, might make it have the structure the planetary system around it have the structure that it does. So this is um, this is a cartoon diagram um, that I like to make. Uh, on this axis is distance from the star. Here is disk mass. This is um, this has no units and that's intentional. Um, the scale here is not intended to be to scale. Um, and the idea here is to not so much to describe reality per se, but to make some hypotheses that we can then try to interrogate um, with the data. And so to make those hypotheses based on, um, on, on, on the model, right? So in that story that I just told you, it makes sense that the disk mass, the solid disk mass in particular, plays a key role in telling you what kind of planetary system you might make. So in the middle here, uh, I've put a system like the solar system. So the brown is supposed to be terrestrial planets, the red gas giants, and then the blue ice giants. And we just described why you might have, you know, inner rocks in the middle, gas giants and the outside ice giants. And then you can imagine if the disk mass goes up, then those isolation masses get larger and you, if you can make it gas giants potentially over a wider range of disk radii um, as your disk mass your solid surface density of your disk gets smaller, then it, you make smaller solid things. It's harder to make an ice, a, a gas giant. And if you go way up high to the top of the disk mass here, then you might be able to make so many gas giants that you have a big dynamical upheaval that mixes everything all up um, and messes up the original structure of the system. All right, so I think that this is, uh, this is nice and this might be correct. This is the idea here is that if disk mass is a key parameter in determining what kind of system you have, then, um, then this should be, you know, at least a simple version of the range of systems that you might make. All right. Okay. Um, 
one of the uh, so one of the uh, one of the first results um, that we had. So sorry, I still have one more thing before I come to the to the to the questioning here. Um, one of the first results that um, you know was famously uh, shown for the structures of planetary systems that changed as a function of a particular property of a star is the you know the planet metallicity correlations. So this is from Fisher and Valenti back in 2005. Um, this shows the stellar metallicity, um, iron over hydrogen ratio, and this shows the percent of stars with planets as discovered at that time. So you can see a very clear correlation here between um, low metallicity is low likelihood of having planets and high metallicity is high likelihood of having planets. Um, but of course, at this time, the kinds of planets that were easiest to find were, uh, were hot Jupiters, so close in giant planets. And um, I want to point out that uh, structures like this um, actually depend on looking again at the wide range of uh, parameter space of a system. So I want to show you um, uh, this same result, but, uh, but illustrated across um, a wider range of semi-major axis space. So here's a uh, semi-major axis from 0.01 AU to 10 AU. And um, now we have, I want you to focus in here on the white region, which is where the gas giant planets, sort of the Jupiter mass, here's one Jupiter mass kinds of planets live. And you'll notice that low metallicity stars seem to show gas giants at larger distances than a little bit interior to 1 AU, which is again what you would expect from that standard um, planet formation model that we showed. Um, but then if you look at high metallicity stars, now suddenly this parameter space is filled in quite a bit more. So this is consistent with the idea that if you around a high metallicity star, it's easier to make a bunch of gas giants and they have a dynamical upheaval event that they might fill in um, this region through one of a number of potential dynamical processes. So again, um, that high metallicity stars produce more planets uh, feature that we're seeing is actually really just a function of the interior part of planetary systems, the inner region of planetary systems. And when you go out to larger distances, um, it, that's less clear. And so I think that, uh, that this is good evidence that at the top of that cartoon that I was showing you, there's some sort of you know, dynamical um, upheaval uh, kind of uh, part of the plot where, you, um, where you've kind of messed up the, the original structure of your system. Uh, that you've formed. All right. So again, show you again. That's that's sort of the dynamically up, the dynamical upheaval region, I would say. Okay. So so now I'm finally at the point where um, where recent results have have called some of these ideas into question, and and fundamentally, the the question is that this idea of isolation, the isolation mass, has become suspect. And it's become suspect because uh, of the presence of gas. So gas does a few things. The first thing is that it causes drift of small solids in protoplanetary disks. And we know that there are small, there's small solids in disks because we can see them. We can see them, for example, with ALMA in the outer regions of disks, they're there. Um, and as they interact with the, the gas, um, they should drift toward their star. And the basic idea there is that if you have a star and you have gas, then in the gas, there's a radial pressure gradient pointing outwards from the star. That means that from the gas's perspective, it's orbiting a slightly lower mass star than the actual mass of the star. So it orbits at a little bit less than the Keplerian velocity. But if you put a big, even a small solid body in there, it's gonna to try to orbit at the Keplerian velocity. So it'll feel a headwind. And that headwind will cause it to lose angular momentum and fall in toward the star. And um, the drag acceleration is a function of that particle size, right? So if you're bigger, you have a smaller surface area uh, to mass ratio and you feel a smaller acceleration. So this is a size dependent process that causes drift through the nebula. The other thing that the gas can do is it can enhance the accretion rate of small solids onto a growing planetary core. And here's just an example of that. This is called pebble accretion. Um, you have your little planetesimal that comes in and as it gets close to the core and falls into its um, interior to its uh, 
you know, region of, of gravitational influence, then if its relative velocity with that core is dissipated, then it can be dynamically captured due to gas drag and then spiral in and accrete onto the core. And this can enhance the accretion cross section um, by quite a bit in a size dependent way, um, causing uh, growth of cores to happen on very fast time scales if the right size particles are present. All right, so let me say that again with some diagrams. Um, I'm happy to say it twice because it's, uh, it's an important concept. So if you have no gas around, satellites can orbit, as I said before, inside the hill radius of our core. That's like the Rochel radius, it's the region of tidal um, influence, you know, beyond that tidal gravity uh, pulls things away from our core. With gas, there's um, that uh, region of stability is modified a bit. And that's because gas drag can, can pull small particles away from the core. So if the gravity, if the drag acceleration on a particle from its interaction with the gas is larger than the gravitational force um, from the core that is trying to orbit, then it will be pulled away. Um, so that gives us a new stability radius. We like to call this the wish radius for wind shearing, but also for whoosh. Um, and inside this radius, uh, you still uh, can, can orbit the core in principle, but um, outside of it, then your small bodies get pulled off. So now if we take that radius, which is less than or equal to the hill radius, and send a small particle in there and it can dissipate its relative kinetic energy with respect to the core as it crosses the stability radius due to gas drag, then it will be dynamically captured um, by the core and then it will spiral in and be accreted. Um, and this again is called pebble accretion and it can happen all the way out to a hill radius which can enhance your, uh, your capture cross section by a radius factor of 100 by a cross section factor of 10 to the four. I mean, it can be embarrassingly, embarrassingly efficient, very fast, if you have the right particle sizes available. All right, so here's a, um, a movie of this happening in a numerical simulation by Zian Zhu and Training Bai. Um, uh, this is a, a 3D simulation with non-ideal MHD disk turbulence. And you can see these particles um, being captured by this core and, um, and accreting. And we've shown that uh, our analytic uh, calculations of this accretion rate are consistent with these um, simulations. All right, so, so what does this mean? So we said that there's a classic uh, um, uh, model for, for how the solar system structure is formed and that gas uh, drift and growth has calls, into, calls us into question in large part because of calling the concept of isolation into question. If particles are drifting through the nebula, they can go into that isolation region. You can't stop them. Um, and also because uh, it's causing things to grow a lot more quickly than we thought. All right, so now I'm gonna come to some of the ideas that we've been having in our group about this um, recently and, and what they might say for the structure of interplanetary systems and for predictions um, for when we can extend those uh, uh, you know, observations to larger distances. All right. So classic terrestrial planet formation, I said, was limited by available mass, so that local isolation mass. Um, and again, enhanced by crossing orbits in a giant impact phase. So that last little bit of growth with giant impacts. With pebble accretion, you're not limited by your local mass. The drift of small solids due to gas drag provides a large source of material moving through the disk. And for some reasonable numbers, you know, I plugged in here, you can get um, something like 100 Earth masses over 10 to the six years of solid material flowing through the inner disk, um, which is, of course, a lot larger than an Earth mass and even larger than super Earth masses. So given that, um, okay, and furthermore, that material can be accreted very quickly by growing cores. So this is a complicated um, plot, but I just want you to take away um, three things from it. First is uh, this is a growth time scale as a function of small particle size and core mass 
for various different turbulence levels in the disk. And the first thing I want you to take away from this is that blue here is you know, 10 to the four to 10 to the five years, and there's a lot of blue on these plots. So you can have much less than million year growth time scales. And this is even at 30 AU. This is, this is like, uh, it's even faster in the inner disk. Um, so the first is that growth can be very fast. The second is that it's very time dependent. The whole, blot, the whole plot isn't blue. It depends on what particle size you have. Um, and uh, the third point is just that we can do these calculations and there are many regimes and it's actually kind of annoying to get it all right. But, but we, can, we, can, we can do these calculations uh, uh, and see that growth time scales are very fast in the inner, in the inner disk. Um, okay, so growth time scales are really fast. There's a ton of material coming by. Um, so what stops things from growing? Why don't we just have gas giants um, in the inner disk? Uh, in all systems. And I told you that it was embarrassingly fast, right? So one way is we can say, oh, well, you just don't have the right particle sizes. And that's a possibility. It's not the one I'm gonna talk about today, but if you can like grind things down to small particle sizes, then they won't accrete to very small particle sizes, then potentially they won't accrete that well. So that's one way. Um, and another way that I am gonna talk about today of, of stopping your growth is to have some sort of limiting mass for pebble accretion growth. And there have been two that have been suggested recently. One is known as pebble isolation and the other is known as flow isolation. And I'll tell you um, about them both in a moment. But first I'll tell you that both of these processes in the inner disk, specifically in the inner disk, limit growth to approximately the thermal mass. And what is the thermal mass? is this mass scale here. So it's the mass of the star times the aspect ratio of the disk cubed. And this is the mass where that hill radius we were talking about is about equal to the scale height um, of the disk. And it's also um, at, at that same mass approximately equal to uh, the size of the atmosphere of the growing planet when it's still embedded in the disk. So, um, so this mass so in the outer disk, these two processes diverge. I'm not going to go into that. I'm happy to talk with you about it later. But in the inner disk, they're both at approximately this mass scale. And the key thing here is that this doesn't depend on disk surface density at all. It just depends on the disk temperature. So the scale height of the disk is set by its temperature and of course on the mass of the star. So, so this mass scale is set again, not by the amount of material available, but by the temperature in, in your disk. And I'll just mention briefly that um, there is actually a characteristic mass scale in the Kepler data that has been interpreted by Yenshin Wu as associated with thermal mass. Okay, so what are these two mass scales that limit here? First, um, the pebble isolation mass. This is, um, uh, this is a set when a planet starts to open a gap in its disk, and that happens at approximately the thermal mass scale. Um, when the scale height of the disk is comparable to, you know, that the hill radius uh, of the planet. And at that point, it sets up a, uh, a density perturbation at the edge of the gap. And that density perturbation can capture pebbles as they drift through the disk. Um, they can get caught into that density, uh, that overpressured region of the disk and be prevented from accreting onto the planet. Um, now, uh, this is a really nice model. Um, I think that there are some things that we need to worry about in terms of once you've captured a lot of mass in these overdensities, what happens then? Um, but this is very nice. It, uh, it stops those pebbles. It solves uh, both problems. It stops the, the pebbles from, from drifting um, into the region where they're going to be accreted. Um, and it stops the planet from growing too much. I'm gonna spend a little more time on um, on the other process flow isolation because that's what we've been working on. And again, just to remind you that in pebble accretion, the wish radius is the radius uh, where a pebble can stably orbit a core. Um, and pebble accretion happens when a pebble comes into the wish radius, uh, dissipates its kinetic energy and is captured um, by the growing core due to uh, interaction with gas, due to gas drag. Okay, so, but what happens, um, okay, so if we have, here's our, our 
when our atmosphere's radius, so the Bondi radius, this is where um, the gravitational field of the planet can bind the, the gas in the disk around it, um, becomes larger than that wish radius. Well, what happens is that instead of being captured by pebble accretion, um, the gas flows, uh, particles are no longer captured by pebble accretion. Uh, the, the background gas flows around the atmosphere of the growing planet. This is a very um, simplistic version of that gas flow. It can actually be fairly complicated. Some There can be a few streamlines that go into the planet. Um, so it doesn't all go entirely around. But for the most part, uh, in simulations uh, that have been done of this, the gas flows around the atmosphere of the growing planet. And if you go through the calculations, you find that small particles uh, that would have been accreted, because they're well bound to the gas, they actually are well enough coupled to the gas that they flow around the growing planet as well. So not only are they not preferentially captured by pebble accretion um, anymore, they are prevented from accreting at all, even if they would have otherwise um, made it onto the planet. Um, and this is what we call flow isolation. So particles can be isolated from accreting onto the planet um, under different conditions if the particles are different sizes. So this is a, again, a particle size dependent process. Um, so, it, so the mass of planet that you end up needing to flow isolate from all of the particles around depends on what particle sizes are available to accrete. But um, in the inner regions of, uh, of protoplanetary disks, we think that particles of sizes all the way up to close to being marginally coupled to the gas. So that means that their stopping times are comparable uh, to their orbital periods. And that's for just for aficionados, that's uh, known as the Stokes number. That's how well coupled you are to the gas. Um, uh, we think that particles, uh, you know, close to marginally coupled are available and, um, and thus you need something like a thermal mass again to isolate uh, growth from all particle sizes. Now, if, if, the, if the particles are, if only small part smaller particles are present, then you can flow isolate at a lower mass than this. Okay, so this is flow isolation. So, um, so what does that do for us um, in the inner regions of protoplanetary disks? Well, if we plot the flow isolation mass um, for a range of uh, accretion rates through uh, a disk with some, some standard parameters, um, this is for a Stokes number of 10 to the minus two, so a little bit less than, uh, than that marginally coupled uh, one, um, then we get these uh, results for our flow isolation mass. Um, why does the accretion rate through the disk matter? It matters because again, it's the disk temperature that determines the mass that you reach, not the disk surface density in these models. And in the inner regions of protoplanetary disks for observed accretion late rates like these here, um, the inner temperature tends to be set by local dissipation of accretion energy. Whereas in the outer disks, when you start uh, looking out here, um, it starts being dominated by passive irradiation from the host star. So you'll notice uh, two things here. The first one is that here's this gray region. Um, that's the super earth mass region. And you know a number of these lines are sitting right in that region at super earth masses. There's one that's lower here at an earth mass. And the second thing I'll point out here is that, um, you know, these lines are pretty flat. So I'll just, uh, uh, you know, draw, you know, a couple of planets here, here um, by way of illustration. Um, and, you know, if you're making uh, a set of planets that are limited by their flow or pebble isolation mass in the inner disk, um, then this is a reason why you might have similar sized siblings uh, in these inner regions of disks. And that's in fact um, observed, it's been reported by several authors, including uh, Lauren Weiss and Sarah Mulholland and their collaborators um, showing that uh, in these inner regions of planetary systems where super Earths are present, typically systems with multiple planets have planets of comparable masses. 
Okay. So, um, so actually before I go on, I'm going to go on to gas giants. Oops. I'm going to stop there for a moment to ask if, if anyone has a, any questions. Um, could I ask about the anger momentum budget? I'm going back to the early stage where you talked about the role of disk mass. I would have thought the specific angle momentum budget, which is a somewhat separate issue, would have a role to play. I understand, of course, that the angle momentum in the solid planets can evolve separately from the disk with the sum being roughly conserved, but doesn't it matter what the specific angle momentum budget is at the beginning? Um, in the solids, do you mean like the the as the particles are drifting through the disk, then they're exchanging angular momentum with the gas, so they can dump a lot of their angular momentum into the disk gas. Okay, but does it matter if the system starts out with a characteristic size of 100 AU versus 10 AU versus 1 AU? Um, yes, absolutely. In terms of how much uh, solid material you have there you know, to drift through your inner region of your disk. Um, uh, so the numbers that I put in there were for some reasonable numbers, but, um, but it, it is going to matter um, for a particular system what, what your disk size is uh, in terms of how much material can, uh, can, can flow through. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's still not clear to me, even for relatively smaller disks, um, that you're going to be limited by your initial, so by your by your local solid budget. Let me put it that way. There's more mass in the outer disk than there is in the inner disk. So if what you if the budget that you have is the mass in the outer disk, that's just a lot bigger than what you would assume if you just started with your surface density in the inner disk. But yes, in any in in, in any particular system, if you had a limited mass to begin with, then that would that would limit you. Anyone else? Ruth, can I ask a quick question? So Absolutely. what, yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this plot. Can you, can you explain uh, again what the different lines are and why the red line kind of curves downward is with the increasing semi-major axis while the other ones go up? Yeah, so this is um, a plot of the flow isolation mass um, and these are for different uh, for different disk accretion rates. Um, and for this particular, so there, so that sets different temperature structures, but this plot also includes um, the, uh, the relative velocities of the, the particle. So I believe that this particular plot is what well, I'm trying to remember is for this particular plot, which thing we set fixed, because you always have some choices about which things you're going to set fixed. And um, the, the, the thing that's a little bit um, counterintuitive um, in these uh, plots is that if you um, fix your surface density, and then you change your accretion rate, then if you have a larger accretion rate than, um, then you're dissipating I always get myself turned around in circles on this because the, the, the problem is that if you have, um, you qualitatively speaking, you, you want it, like if you're looking at different things, you want it to be that if you have a higher accretion rate, then you high, have a higher disk temperature. Um, but if you have a, a higher, let me, let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to like process this as I'm giving the rest of my talk and I'm gonna answer you at the end, Constantine, because it has to do the, but the answer to the rest of your question about why it goes down is I think that you're hitting um, a, a change in the gas drag law. 
So there are a lot of kinks in these things because of that, but I'm gonna come back to the to what I was trying to process in my head, my mind at the end. All right, thanks. All right, so, um, so uh, okay. So, so super earths. So again, there, there. Um, let me uh, let me move on. I'm going to talk about about gas giants now. And um, one of the interesting consequences of thinking about this as the limit for your core growth process um, is that it can give you an explanation for why it might be rare to make gas giants in the inner regions of planetary systems, which we know to be true. Um, but that when they form, um, making multiple gas giants is actually an ultimate, uh, is actually a common outcome of gas giant formation in interplanetary systems. Okay, so, so let me connect that to what I said before. And then I'm gonna tell you about a really fun idea that we've been working on, which is why I think that this would be a nice thing to be true. Okay, so on the left here, this is a plot from Cassandra Anderson showing the thermal mass um, in, uh, in, a, in an example disk um, as a function of distance from the star. And in the inner regions of the disk, just like we saw before, this is a, uh, this is a flat um, uh, profile. And then as you go far from the star, um, you end up having your thermal mass go up. And this is where, um, and this is where passive irradiation starts uh, dominating uh, your disk temperature. So you have sort of flat and then it goes up when you start hitting the irradiated region of the disk. So in this example, this flat uh, part of the disk is at something like um, 10 earth masses, which uh, is intentionally chosen to be comparable to um, approximately what might be the critical core mass for gas giant formation. So I say like approximately what might be because that is a number that first of all is not fixed throughout the disk Second of all, depends strongly on opacities in, their atmos in the atmospheres of the planets that you're uh, creating. So, um, so there's a lot of, of details, equation of state, uh, you know, physics concerns that go into what exactly that critical core mass would be. And I'm not gonna go into any of that today. So for now, let's just say 10 and just remember that it doesn't necessarily mean exactly 10. Okay, so if that inner region of your disk, if your disk parameters are such that that flow isolation mass or, or thermal mass um, in that inner region is above the critical core mass, you could make multiple gas giants in that region. And again, you might have plenty of solid material drifting in from the outer disk to make those cores. Whereas alternatively, and here's a different disk model where you have a much uh, lower thermal mass in the inner region, you might make terrestrial or super earth type planets. Okay. And um, we've uh, run a, a calculation showing that actually you can get reasonable statistics, and I'll show you that if I have time at the end, um, between these two types of systems, if you take um, a set of, you know, if you Monte Carlo and sanity, you know, a sanity check kind of sample of disks, including, you know, different initial disk sizes, as just came up in one of the questions, um, and, you know, stellar masses and, and, and uh, metallicities and so forth. Okay. So, so, so that's nice. So why might we want um, making gas giants to be rare, uh, but when they form making multiple giants to be common? And that comes to, um, to gas giants. Uh, and I just think this is a really fun idea and it does uh, some really nice things for the observations. I don't know if it's right or not to be clear, but I think it's really fun. And that is um, to ask the question, what if there was a really substantial giant impacts phase for the formation of gas giants in the inner regions of planetary systems? Um, so the idea here is that uh, in situ scattering plus, and this is important, substantial collisional growth of multiple gas giants in a population of disks. Through this, we can produce features uh, of the observed gas giant population um, that, that are really nice. Okay, so I just said collisional growth of multiple gas giants in interplanetary systems. So that is certainly not a standard uh, you know, assumption about how planetary systems start, 
I know that, um, you know, we're certainly not the only ones who have suggested that you could make gas giants in inner regions of planetary systems. You know, Constantine, among other people, have worked on this. Um, but, uh, but the, however you get them there, if you assume that you could start with multiple, I don't mean two, I mean like, you know, five gas giants in inner systems, rarely because inner systems of gas giants are not that common. Um, then you can get some nice results and I'll show you that. All right, let me start by saying that known close-in gas giant planets are often much more ma massive than Jupiter. So I'm gonna say we're gonna start with several small gas giants, but small doesn't even have to be that small, right? If you're trying to make things that go up to like 20 Jupiter masses, you could have 20 Jupiter mass planets. I don't really think there are 20, but you could, you could start with pretty big small gas giants and collisionally grow them uh, to get to those really massive giants that we see in inner systems. Um, and uh, as a reminder, the planetary, the gas giants we see in inner systems are often on eccentric orbits. Uh, this is just a subset of the papers that have been written about why gas giants are on eccentric orbits. These are observed radial velocity discovered planets. And I'm gonna show several um, contour plots like this. So I'm just gonna take a moment to, this is for semi-major axis versus observed eccentricity. This is the 90% contour line for uh, containing points on this region of the plot, 80%, 70%. And all of the plots that I'm gonna show you are giving percent contour uh, lines because, um, yeah, so that you can see the percentiles. Um, yeah, and many of these eccentric eccentricities are very large. Okay, so we're going to be considering, um, you know, planet-planet scattering, which has been worked on by a number of authors. Uh, and with the, with the addition of emphasizing the potential for collisional growth. Okay, so when we think of giant impacts and collisional growth, you know, that's a really normal thing to think about for, um, for the inner region of the solar system. You know, we think about again, that giant impacts phase uh, for the formation of the moon, but we don't usually think about that for giant planets. And, um, and because in our solar system, if we think about the giant planet region, we think of interactions between those giant planets as leading to ejections rather than collisions. Um, but planet-planet scattering doesn't lead to collisions for terrestrial planets and ejections for giants. It leads to collisions for close-in planets and ejections for distant planets. Um, and I'll go through that. All right. So I'll just take a moment to explain why that's true. So as you know, if, if you have an encounter between two bodies, a gravitational encounter, and the relative velocity is less than the escape velocity, in this case from, from the planet, uh, then gravitational focusing causes uh, the, the uh, impact parameter for collisions to be larger than just the physical cross section for the planet because gravity can pull in that body and cause it to collide from a larger distance. But at an even larger distance than that, gravity pulls in uh, particles and causes them to be deflected by a large angle. So the strong scattering cross-section, the, the cross-section for scattering by a large amount is larger than the collisional cross-section. Whereas if your relative large velocity is larger than your escape velocity, there's no gravitational focusing and you've just got your your physical cross-section. Collisions prevent strong scattering. Okay, so if we think about what the relative velocity is in a protoplanetary disk, it's about the eccentricity times the circular Keplerian orbital velocity. Um, and that, you know, qualitatively comes back to, you know, epicycles, right? So if here's your blue thing is your orbit and the black circle is your local circle, circular orbit, um, and you put an epicycle on there with uh, a radius of about the semi-major axis times your eccentricity and Keplerian orbits are closed. So you've got to go around the circle once for every once you go around the epicycle. That means every orbital frequency you go around the epicycle and your velocity going around this thing compared to the local circular frame is about equal to the eccentricity times the Keplerian orbital velocity. Now, if we go back to what we saw in the previous slide, if that relative velocity is greater than the escape velocity from a planet, then you'll get collisions. And 
put that all together and you find that the maximum eccentricity before collisions set in is about equal to the ratio of the escape velocity from your planet to the Keplerian velocity, which is comparable to the escape velocity from the star. So you have a ratio of escape velocity from the planet to the star. So in other words, um, if you're, so what that means is that um, if your relative velocity is greater than the Keplerian velocity, this number will be larger than one. You'll, you'll escape from the system before you ever get limited by collisions. But um, if your escape velocity from your planet is larger than, uh, oops. Oh, right, so if your escape velocity from your planet, in other words, if your escape velocity from your planet is larger than your Keplerian velocity, then you expect to eject things before collisions ever set in. Okay, so to say that in a, a slightly simpler way, if you're close to the star, you're in a deep potential well. And so it's hard for interactions with other planets to eject you from the system and eventually you start colliding. Whereas if you're far from the star, then you're in a less deep potential well. And so interactions with neighboring planets can cause you to be ejected from the star before collisions ever start setting in. Okay. So um, to say that again in pictures, uh, if scattering, uh, uh, so due to, um, scattering due to gravitational focusing uh, happens when your relative velocity is less than the escape velocity from the planet. In the inner system, it's hard to escape from the star. So you get excited until you start colliding. In the outer system, it's easy to escape from the star. So you get excited by interactions with your neighbors until, um, until you get ejected. Okay, so, and this is seen in all of the scattering simulations um, that people run. All right, so if we look, this is still the data. Um, you can see that if you put that envelope for eccentricities that we just calculated on the data, it matches reasonably well to, the, to, to this inner region of the observed planets. This is for a median, median planet properties. Um, and then this model in the outer system, you would get ejections. Okay, so that means that in the inner system, because, you know, oops, because that uh, this envelope means that you would be colliding in here, that means that there should be giant impacts for, for giant planets. And, um, and why I'm excited about this idea is this one, uh, is this additional piece of, uh, of observational information. And this looks like the same plot, but it's an entirely different plot. Now this is planet mass, and this is observed eccentricity. And the key thing here is that the higher mass planets have the higher eccentricities, which if you think about it is kind of weird because it's easier to kick a lower mass thing. So you might think that lower mass planets would be kicked to higher eccentricities by interactions. And in fact, if you run a scattering simulation for a single system, that's definitely true. Um, but if you look at the data, the higher mass planets have higher eccentricities, okay. So this was, this was our motivation for thinking about this. Why would that be true? And you know, furthermore, if you look at, if you cut um, the data to look at the higher eccentricity, sorry, the higher metallicity stars and um, versus the lower metallicity stars, and you can see that those really high eccentricity, high mass planets tend to be around high metallicity stars. Those are the blue ones. Okay. One last observational plot before I show the numerical, the simulation results. Um, if we plot back now on semi-major axis eccentricity space, the, uh, the contours of planets around high and low metallicity stars, you find that the high metallicity stars um, show these, uh, these higher eccentricity warm Jupiters. So these, these warm Jupiters with really high eccentricities tend to be around high metallicity stars. And you can see that on this plot as well. Oh, Ruth, this is your five minute warning. All right, cool, I'm, I'm close to done. Thank you. Okay, so here's the idea. Perhaps high metallicity stars produce a larger number of massive planets. In these disks, all the planets are excited to high eccentricities through planet-planet scattering as they grow. Um, and we did a number, uh, a series of numerical simulations. I'm happy to tell you more details about them. The non-standard assumption, the one, and this is the only um, non-standard assumption is that you start with many gas giants instead of many smaller gas giants instead of a few large ones. Um, 
Critically, we had to include a mass radius relation as we did this. If we used, uh, if we didn't do a good mass radius relation for, for the planets as they grew, then we didn't get high enough eccentricities. Um, and the one fine tuning parameter that we used is that we chose a set of disk masses. And by disk, I don't mean disk right now. I just mean total initial masses in gas giant planets such that um, after the final collisional growth outcome, we ended up with a set of planet masses that um, roughly match the observational data. And the nice thing about this is that to do that, that really only the initial, as long as you have enough planets that they're colliding and growing, um, it doesn't really matter their initial distribution. Um, it's just the initial total mass that gives you your final planet mass. So that made this nicer. Um, and here's the results. So with that fine tuning of just getting the highest mass planets, sorry, getting the mass, uh, the planet mass distribution to match the data, that was the one tuning parameter and that's all we tuned. We get here the observations versus the simulations of mass of the planet and eccentricity. And we get something that matches really nicely. So again, the disks with more mass and gas giants have more giant impacts, more massive planets, higher eccentricities. I'll just flash through. We were able to get um, a reasonable match to those um, metallicity distributions with some major axis as well, that eccentricity envelope. Um, we can see that those highest high mass, uh, high eccentricity ones are around the, the, the stars that started with the most initial mass in planets. And um, if we look at a larger scale, so here now we have distance where collisions are happening in the inner part, scattering in the outer part. So I'm going to jump to, um, and, we, and we look at our distribution of masses, and this is the observational prediction for this model. We find that the higher mass planets are results of collisions in the inner about 8 AU, and it peaks at around 3 AU. This is not frequency of gas giants. This is actual mass of gas giants. The most massive things are in, uh, at several AU. And if we look at the radial velocity and the direct imaging data, um, this is consistent with current results. But what it predicts is that as we go to larger distances, the maximum mass of planets that we see should start to decline because that's where those injections start kicking in instead of collisional growth. All right, so, um, so I said I'd come back if I have time and I don't really to, these, uh, to this um, distribution of gas giants versus uh, super earths, but I'll just say that, um, that, that if you use this model, then what ends up being on this plot here, instead of disk mass is disk temperature. And we can, we can do a sanity check kind of Monte Carlo um, and get reasonable distributions of super earths and gas giants and mixture systems that match various observational signatures. And I will, I will end there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. That was a really great talk. Um, all right, did we have questions? Um, I see Phil has raised his hand. You should feel you can feel free to raise your hand um, on the on Zoom to to indicate right, you're, right. you'd like to ask a question. Uh, go ahead, Phil. Hi, this is Jesse. Actually, um, oh, sorry. Hi. Really sorry, great. it lists both of your names. I'm sorry about that. It's it's really okay. Um, so uh, I was curious this this model that you are showing right at the end. It's you know it's successfully reproducing these distributions. Does it have a different time scale associated with it compared to like? The, the small number of very large gas giants compared to the uh, larger number of smaller gas giants? Like, is there an observational thing we could test with age to kind of show whether or not this is the case? So this model is um, assuming that the, the that pebble accretion is happening very quickly and you, your growth stops when you hit um, the thermal mass, either due to pebble or flow isolation. So that's a process that happens um, quite quickly, and then it's it's stopping you from from growing further than that um, while the disk is still uh, while the gas disk is still present. So um, so that particular model doesn't include dynamical evolution beyond there. You could still have you know even you know, for the smaller planets, a dynamical upheaval and giant impact phase, and you can still make the moon later on and change those masses a little bit, but it's telling you that you can get the range of scales of systems and have them match um, appropriately. So I'm not sure that um, age is going to be the right 
thing to look at for this particular model, but this is a plot as a function of stellar mass. So we can look at these things across um, different types of systems. And I think that that's where we're going to um, be able to uh, you know, address these statistics more effectively. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, next question is from Dave. Um, concerning families of giant planets and possible giant impacts. I, I would have thought that it would be necessary to think about the angular momentum budget of the gas accreting onto the planets, which of course would tend to produce disks and make those planets from the collisional point of view be much larger than the normal concept of radius because the Hill sphere radius for them is even larger. Is that thought about? Because that would matter in, I mean, I understand your argument about uh, eccentricity growth that's very similar to very old ideas going back to Sofranoff and Weberall for terrestrial planets, but but isn't it different when you have gas giants? Yeah, so when they're still in the disk, um, in the protoplanetary disk phase, uh, I completely agree that they should have uh, disks around them. Um, I think that when I'm thinking about this collisional growth phase, I'm really thinking about post, uh, post the protoplanetary disk post the um, really, you know, massive protoplanetary, in this case, I mean, disk around the gas giant planet phase, um, you know, over the next maybe 100 million years um, when it's just dynamical evolution that's happened. And I think that the reason um, that we're thinking about it that way is not so much because um, you couldn't have uh, collisions and coagulation while the disk is around, but while that's happening, the gas in you know the circumstellar disk could also be damping the planetary eccentricity substantially, you know, through dynamical friction. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not so I'm imagining that you know we're starting with whatever is the state that's left over after the you know substantial amounts of gas dissipate. Um, and then you're having this growth phase. And what makes me feel okay about making that assumption in this model is that, again, it, the results don't depend a huge amount on how you start things out, as long as you have enough planets around to have you know, a big upheaval going on. So- Okay, and, and what is the time scale? There must be a time scale that comes out of this. Yeah, so, so this is about, um, 30 million years until you reach sort of a statistical equilibrium state. And that's consistent with previous um, planet scattering work. And then as you go to longer timescales, there continue to be collisions um, and it evolves a little bit over time, um, but you don't, um, but the, the statistical distribution that we're plotting uh, doesn't change dramatically after that. Though you do start having, uh, you know, gradually fewer planets per system. Uh, you know, in the results that we showed after about 20, 30 million years, um, you see typically one and uh, sometimes two planets in, you know, in simulated radial velocity data. Um, and that, you know, edges from two toward one as you go to larger time scales, but the dynamics don't change a whole lot. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, Catherine? I was wondering, do smaller stars tend to have smaller planets or fewer planets or both? Well, in, uh, they have smaller planets in this model because the temperature is smaller. Smaller stars are much less luminous. And um, so, they, so they make smaller planets in this model. Um, this particular model doesn't say much about how many planets you make because to get pebble accretion going, you actually have to reach uh, a minimum mass before pebble accretion can kick in. And, um, you know, and that depends on planetesimal formation and, you know, early growth, which uh, is a problem in and of itself, though not so, it's not so much a problem in the inner disk, but it's not, it's not modeling how many you make. Thanks. Okay, so we're a few minutes past the hour. So I think uh, unless there's any uh, last minute, very quick questions, um, we can adjourn and say thank you very much to Ruth for a very nice talk and um and now we'll move on to the um oh there's one more thing Ruth wanted to say oh I just wanted to briefly like in response to what Constantine asked oh earlier. yes um Go ahead. yeah so right so these disc models you have to make an you have to make uh, a couple of choices 
and maybe since we're over time, I won't go into all the details. I can talk to you, Constantine, later. But but the the short answer is that uh, the kinks come because you end up having a uh, drag law differences. Um, sorry, that's not answering any more than I did before. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Constantine, can you stick around for the faculty meet and greet after this? <laughs>